Hello and welcome to our bookshop. I've just clicked to record and anyone on YouTube would know I've just done that because they've started playing and uh, that's what happens when you click record. Um, my name is Ben. I'm owner of our bookshop in Tring. Um, this is our hundred uh, however many uh, events um, that we've done this year, which is um, rather more than probably good for my sanity, frankly, but it's an absolute pleasure to have three wonderful authors here. Um, I'm going to hold them up in the right order here. So we're, we're here to talk about these two particularly um, with, with Kate and Francesca. Uh, but I would add that Emma, uh, we did the previous event with Emma, which was utterly gorgeous, uh, all on a similar sort of subject. So I do feel as though um, uh, we've got a wonderful hour set ahead. So Emma is, um, Emma is in charge tonight uh, and I'm quite keen you do <laughs> if that's, that's all right emma okay with you i love being in charge good right well so without further ado emma let me hand over to you uh yes hello everybody um so the two books uh, as you i'm sure already know because you've booked this event so you have already checked out what they are but um the the authors we have with us are francesca specter who's written alignment say hello francesca Hi everyone. <laughs> uh, and Kate Wills, who is author of A Trip of One's Own. Hello, Kate. Hi everyone. <laughs> uh, Kate is currently in Spain, which is incredibly cool. Um, and Francesca is in Camden, which is equally cool uh, in a different way. I am in Salisbury, which is I don't, I mean, I, I don't know if you've been to Salisbury, maybe you're watching from Salisbury. I, it's lots of things. It's very beautiful. It's very historic. It's lovely. I'm not sure I'd call it cool, um, but it feels really appropriate uh, because I am on a solo trip uh, and I have been uh, doing one of my, this is, this is something that I do myself a lot, uh, is, is go traveling uh, solo, uh, partly because I'm a single woman, uh, partly because like Kate, I am a travel writer, uh, so we have a lot, of, the three of us women have a lot in common, uh, and um, I have been very much practicing what Francesca calls alonement uh, today, uh, as I've been driving around and walking around the Wiltshire countryside and having a lovely solo lunch and meeting people along the way, but also spending some time just walking quietly through nature. Uh, these are the kind of activities and themes that we're going to be getting into because, as Ben said, they go all, all across the three books that, that uh, Kate, Francesca and I have written. Before, uh, before, before we go, uh, can I just check, because I mean, obviously, if people are watching this in, say, November, October, sorry, December, they won't, uh, they won't get this next question. But uh, can we talk temperature? What te uh, Kate, what's the temperature where you are? Um, well, today it was about 30. It's a pretty constant 30 degrees here. Basically. So this is recorded on the 14th of June and uh, we're going through a little mini heat wave in this country. So I don't know what the temperature got to here, but it must be getting up to 30. Maybe not that hot, is it? Maybe 20, 26, 25, 26? Something like that. I think it was 28 at one point today. Well, it's, it's always hotter in London, isn't it? They've, you've always got a couple of degrees on the rest of the country in London. Oh, Baking. <laughs> <laughs> um, I, for the UK <laughs> might as well not be in Spain guys come on you're making me feel bad true come come back come back Kate <laughs> we've made it all nice for you you can come back exactly. now. Okay. um you just may have to quarantine for a little bit when you do yeah, in in a heat wave which makes <laughs> more, more unfair <laughs> um so this subject of um doing life solo um, uh, is is a subject that I certainly, and I bet I bet the other two authors here have been told is quite a brave one to write about. And this is really interesting um, as, you know, as the person who writes about it, um, because certainly in all of our cases, we're just writing about our own lives. Um, these are three, uh, you know, very memoir heavy books and so it's 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 not usual for one to think oneself is brave um kate i know that you have been told just as i have so many times that traveling alone is an incredibly brave thing to do um but as you very you, you 
say so perfectly in your book it, if it's not if it's something you're not actually afraid of is it is it actually really brave <laughs> what's your experience <laughs> Yeah, that's always the thing that's baffled me about it really is is when people kind of want to praise you for being so courageous and um for me it, it kind of is, is actually just preferable so I just thought I take I take that brave compliment though and I wear it and I'm like thanks um but yeah I, I mean for me um there are there are obviously moments when when you're traveling by yourself um where you do need to kind of draw on those inner reserves of, of bravery and, and you do sometimes feel a little bit um, anxious and, and apprehensive in a way that you wouldn't maybe if you were with friends or, or a partner or family. But for me, the benefits of solo travel totally outweigh any of the risks that you might associate with it or um, that you might, you might think about it. I mean, I, I feel like, um, I feel like a lot of people, it's, it's quite a big kind of, um, it's quite a scary idea and then once they actually do it um and you get a taste of it you realize that there's nothing to be afraid of with solo travel so yeah for me it's 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 no longer um such a a brave feat as uh, as people people might think and what about for you francesca because you you've written about um learning to spend time alone I think maybe for you it was a it was a bit different I think maybe for you spending time alone was a scary thing um to contemplate at, at the start of this project hmm. it was I mean it's interesting the the idea again yes of being brave and sort of applying that to you know a book that is written from memoir um and it, it's it's hard to sort of say that of yourself definitely at the time when you're doing it um but I think you know for me the I suppose interesting or unexpected thing about me going into this book and writing a book about being alone is that I I was and I still am a massive extrovert so for me it very much was a can be and something that was if not brave certainly very counterintuitive going into learning to be alone but what it what it was for me was it was the lesser of two evils because I began to realize how much leaning into my fear of being alone, which I'd done sort of my whole life. And, you know, society lets you do this, that, you know, it lets you avoid any alone time through being on your phone all the time or, you know, pre-pandemic, particularly, you know, being a very sociable creature, it's very praised. But I realized that actually I was missing out on a lot of life through defining myself only when, you know, by being around other people. So I was staying in the wrong relationships. I was refusing to sort of give any time to my passions, my interests, um, you know, my hobbies. Uh, I, I wasn't living essentially. And at the end of the day, it seemed like the less scary prospect to try and conquer my fear, the fear that was getting in the way of living rather than not do that and let my life be defined by it. So, all three of these books that that um, we've mentioned, they're, they're they're all by women who um, who basically started to really kind of interrogate and think about um, be their their life on their own. Um, uh, Francesca's is um, elopement is um, essentially as she's just described uh, about uh, learning to. Uh, spend time on one's own and um, I mean it, it's the subtitle is how to be alone and absolutely own it so that's that's the kind of theme there um, Kate's a trip of one's own is is um, quite specifically from from your travel writing background about about going and um, you were already somebody who traveled solo because you did it for work but uh, you you then went as a single woman um, and started to kind of explore this theme more deeply. The thing that is both of your books have in common is that in each instance, the the story really starts with a breakup. It, the, 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 it comes about as a result of, of a relationship breakup. Um, so I'm, I'm interested to know how much time either of you, if any, had spent before those breakups ever thinking about, um, about singleness and solo life because I do wonder whether it's something that 
is, we're quite bad at engaging with both a, a, as individuals and uh, as a society what, what do you think Kate? Yeah definitely and I think that's why it's so interesting that all three of our books are kind of touching on this subject now and celebrating it in in different ways because for me certainly you know I I have barely had any single time in my adult life you know I would just leapfrog from one relationship to the next and um, yeah the idea of being on my own without either a partner or just somebody I was texting or you know somebody I was interested in that that was that was actually really terrifying um, and I think that is like a big source of fear for a lot of women just because of how society makes us feel is that you know being in a couple or being in a partnership is like your ultimate goal and if you're not doing that or on the way to doing that then you know there's you know, what's wrong with you so yeah I think um getting divorced um when I was 34 um a few years ago was like a really big wake-up call to me that I hadn't actually um, had any time um, just to kind of sit with myself and, and enjoy being single and, and all the, the great benefits that can come from that. So yeah, it was, um, it was a big shift in, in my thinking really. Um, and, and yeah, just started to kind of enjoy, enjoy solo life. I mean, Francesca, when you describe at the start of your book, you describe um, your attempts to kind of keep your relationship together uh, it, it it really kind of will resonate with a lot of people who've who've stayed in relationships just a bit too long because they they would rather be in a relationship than um, than than let it go even if it's not quite the right relationship and you and it, and you sort of there, there is a, there is a moment of awful acrimony that involves throw pillows and um, being in public uh, at, at a at a showroom. But the line that really kind of that really spoke to me was the one where you talked about um, that you were trying to piece piece us together like a logic puzzle. And I thought that that is that feels like that middle time when you know that this isn't working but you would really really like it to work because you'd, you'd rather that than the alternative is, is that is that what you were sort of experiencing yes I think you know it's funny we we conflate the words alone and single um and but definitely you know in my mind they were the same thing um at that time and you know I I thought I'm in a relationship with someone who, you know, I, I, I have been in love with, you know, perhaps we're falling out of love, but, you know, I can't go backwards. You know, this is, this is the insurance policy against being alone and surely, surely we can make it work because nothing, you know, because no alternative would be better. And I think it's, it's funny. I, I we talk about working at a relationship and I, you know, I've no doubt that, 20 years into marriage, that's something that you should definitely be doing. I don't know about two years into a relationship in, in your late 20s, whether that's something you really should be doing, that there's any necessity to do. But it just seemed like the better alternative to breaking up. And that seems so unthinkable. And I think we put these things off. And it, there's actually, there's a stat I use in that same foreword that the fear of being single is the most reliable indicator that you'll stay in a failing relationship, which is just so telling about what we're actually trying to avoid when we're trying to avoid breaking up with someone. Yeah, and Kate, you, you obviously wrote in the book quite a bit about how long you'd stayed in, in this marriage. Um, and I mean, it must have been absolutely devastating to to have to leave what were what were the what were the things about singleness that scared you because you were already a solo traveler it feels like you, you know you're you already sound like as we've said a fairly fearless woman yeah it's funny isn't it in in that aspect of my life I suppose I was really comfortable being alone and I think um and I think in a way that's sort of quite telling as to how the relationship wasn't really working because I had spent so much time on my own or feeling alone. Um, and that's something that, that I would, would really say to people as well is that actually 
you know there's nothing lonelier than being in the wrong relationship you know you you when you're alone you don't have to feel lonely it's when you're with the wrong person and and so yeah I mean although it was devastating because you know we'd been together for 12 years and so you know we'd really kind of built our lives together um it definitely felt like the right thing but yes it's it's funny because I feel like there's an acceptance of being single in your 20s almost kind of an encouragement of you know live it up you're in your 20s and then it's like in your 30s it's a bit like oh well you know maybe you should be like settling down and having kids at this point and so for me to be doing the opposite of that you know mid mid 30s just having been in this stable relationship and then just chucking it all up in the air I think a lot of um a lot of my friends were kind of like oh like are you sure and a few people actually said to me even people who I didn't know very well were like well you know don't, don't you want kids like you know you're you're 34 and you know if, if I was you I'd just kind of stick it out was sort of their um their reasoning which which is always like so so surprising to me and also so sad that people would would stay in something out of out of fear as Francesca said of, of the alternative which is being alone and and this this kind of idea that we have of like dying alone as if that's like <laughs> the ultimate failure um, and, you know, yeah exactly being being the spinster eaten by cats and and it just it just doesn't have to be that way and, and, and it's just quite a ludicrous kind of myth that we've all sort of internalized and and I don't know I mean maybe um you could you could say Ben but I don't know if men kind of feel feel that in the same way that that women do this this fear. Uh, to be honest, you know I mean I think um men are oh, we're, a di- we're a different breed and um I think but all men come in different kind of, I'm a very, I'm a very kind of couple kind of person. I always have been, it's kind of, you know, all relationships I've ever had have always lasted years, ages and ages. So it's a, um, because I don't know, it, it's about a give and take and I, I, I suspect, but that's not really the topic of tonight, but. Um, Sorry um, to put you on the spot how now. Does, how does your, <laughs> Kate, how does your, men. sorry, say again. Sorry to put you on the spot as the spokesman for all men there. <laughs> because I'm not a very good spokesman because I, do, I don't think I represent men very well. So, uh, but yeah, how did your, how did um, the ex respond? How, what was his, um, was it your decision? Was it? Yeah, it was my decision. Um, and that, that was, um, that was maybe actually harder in a way. I think it's, you know, people, it is, it is obviously awful to be the person who's, who's broken up with, but I think it's also really hard to be the person who, who does it and, and uh, yeah, to, to make that call. But thankfully we're on really good terms and he, he is an amazing guy. And is you know, I think the fact that he was fine with me writing a book about it <laughs> says a lot, but, um, but yeah, I just, I just think the gender differences is what I was saying is 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 just really interesting in how singleness is viewed. You know, you have the the kind of like fun bachelor versus the like sad spinster, and I feel like we haven't really moved that that far past that, which is a real shame. I I, I can't help thinking because uh, I know a few um, um, men my age, maybe a touch younger, some a few older, who are single, and actually I look at them. And I, I, I don't know. This may be a societal thing. Maybe it's changed. Maybe things. I actually feel more sorry for them, actually, in some ways. Yeah, totally. They, yeah, I, in, in, in many ways, weird one. I know one or two, and there's one guy. He's just he's suddenly grown long hair, and he's suddenly, and it's just like, oh my lord, it's um, yeah. <laughs> maybe the thing is, he may watch this, so I better be careful. <laughs> Do you think that that's because you 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 assume that women have pretty good support networks and and tight links to their families as well, so that we exactly. got exactly. And I think if 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 me and my wife would split up, you know, I would be I'd be on my own. I suspect you know, there's a, I've got a few mates, whatever. But um, whereas she's got dozens of of, of 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 a network, and you know, I think I mean she she basically creates our social activity. Uh, maybe because I'm so busy with bookshops and stuff, but um, uh, so yeah, no, I'd be in trouble, frankly. I, I, I totally acceptance, hand up. Mm. Well, you could read Francesca's book and then you'd 
understand the beauty. Yeah, of this. Francesca, have you? Um, did you speak to a lot of guys when you were uh, when you were researching your book? Because obviously, your book comes from a podcast, and you interview both men and women on your podcast. Have you have you found any um, notable differences in responses between the two genders? Yes, I mean, you know, look, alonement is something that you know can be can be applied sort of whether you're um, you know single or in a relationship. But I think I you know I certainly agree with a lot of what you're saying. I think that maybe while there's there, there are the sort of stereotypes around being single that are sort of more weighed towards you know being a man, being a sort of Don Draper type bachelor versus. Um, you know, being Bridget Jones, but in actuality, um, and you know, and again, from speaking to a lot of uh, men and women on the podcast about their sim relationships and out of them, it does feel like, and it, you know, I, I, it does feel like women are better at being single. And but you know, perhaps this does come from the pressure, I think, to you know, to whether you're a mother or not, to be a sort of nurturer, to be a giver, to, you know, develop those sort of social skills, the way that women are socialized differently to men. I think definitely, you know, especially, you know, later on in life, once you do get past that, you know, the the marriage season where it seems like every weekend defined by a hen, which is sort of my life at the moment, then it it it's much it's you can have a much more fulfilling life, you know, in, in as a single person and it, it seems that there's more of a narrative more of a support system and I think that they're actually you know I was having a conversation with a close friend recently who said I don't have a book on how to be single di- you know directly written for men and I, and I want one because there's no there's no guidebook there's no manual for this particular experience because it is different because I don't have the support networks that my female single friends have that's really yeah that's really interesting I mean I yeah I I made a very conscious decision when I was writing self-contained that I although I really wanted to get into this subject of how it was diff, you know whether and how it was different between um the genders I could I couldn't do it I wouldn't touch it without having done a lot of research you know and it, it was like that's a whole other topic that that would need you know I, I just like Ben doesn't want to speak for all men. I also do not want to speak for all men. Um, and, um, you know, just a few chats with my male friends just didn't feel like it would be enough to kind of, you know, uh, to, to be able to kind of talk about the male experience, especially since, you know, like like your books, my, my own was so personal. Um, it's such a it's such an interesting topic. And um, and and I think one of the great things about writing I mean it's an obvious thing to say is um that you write something like like all we have done and you discover um people are able to access a little bit more of your experience um you know we're all we're living in an age of empathy and we're all so keen to um to be understanding and be kind and walk in each other's shoes and and that's you know really that's a really great movement that that you know has really happened in the last couple of decades I think um but but writing is still something that is really specifically helps us to do that I, along with I mean you know I'm not gonna lie podcasting's <laughs> podcasting's definitely helping too um but I I found I was able to write things that I wouldn't have been able to actually express uh, out loud, even to my closest family. And when my when my parents read my book, um, they said, wow, we feel we know you a lot better. Um, Did did you did you two women get that? Did you did you get that from anyone? We uh, friends suddenly saying, well, I I feel like I now know a bit more what it's like to be you. Yeah, I definitely did, because I think, um, especially with the way social media is now, a lot of my friends were like, wow, like, we had no idea that you were going through this tough time. Like, we just thought, oh, you know, Kate's off having an amazing time in Bali or wherever I was traveling. So quite a few people got in touch with me to say, wow, I can't believe, you know, you went through that. And um, I think, yeah, for for all of us, you know, as writers, it is... um, 
is perhaps a bit easier to kind of put, put pen to paper behind that anonymity than it is to kind of open up in, in person or, or in another form. Um, so that, that was definitely something that happened um, after the book is, is people got in touch with me like that. But, uh, but also, um, also people got in touch to say just how much, um, you know, my experiences had, had really helped them or had touched them or, or resonated with them in some way. And, and um, yeah, I think as, as all of us maybe feel as, as memoirists or people that write about our, our lives, you sometimes kind of can feel quite exposed by that, or I can anyway. And, you know, you wonder if you're, you're sharing too much, but, but for one person to say, oh, you know, I, I read your book and I felt less alone, or, you know, I felt inspired to try solo travel is, has really kind of made that, that uh, exposure <laughs> worth it, I suppose. Well, Francesca, you, you obviously did a lot of, um, you know, you've done a lot of research around the subject of, of alonement versus loneliness. Um, does that help you to, to get some distance? I mean, from it, when, when you're writing, how, were there bits about the book that were particularly difficult to write? And, and does, does the treating it as, you know, like a real genuine kind of like almost scientific academic subject help in any way? Hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, when I sort of describe the uh, breakdown of my book, it's quite, the only thing I can compare it to sometimes is the magazine feature, which would make sense because that's my sort of professional background. But I think being able to blend uh, things like, yeah, my own memoir, which was probably, probably felt more at the time possibly, you know, draining to, like, you know, to write because I had to sort of it was cathartic ultimately, but I had to sort of reach into my soul and sort of maybe confront things that I hadn't even done before writing the book. Um, and but blending that in with uh, the sort of expert studies around things like, you know, there's a lot of research in there about why we struggle to do certain things in public versus why we're, you know, why we feel more able to do other things in public and, you know, all, all those sort of insecurities and you know the psychology behind being alone in lots of different ways so you know it was I think it I think it helped me to feel like it wasn't just my own experience there was also this authority and this sort of expert research behind it and I think you know part of it was also that my book is you know it, it's unique in that i quite literally created the word in the title you know I created the concept of alonement so I suppose I it helped me as I was writing to think okay this is speaking for a universal experience and it's scientifically backed you know it did sort of it did help to have that um but you know in terms of in terms of the memoir I think it is very interesting because I think I you know and this was you know this was my first you know, while I've done confessional um, journalism before, this was obviously, the, you know, a first to do this. And it can feel at times you think, you know, am I, you know, you know, am I speaking for all people who are alone sometimes, which is effectively everyone, but, you know, is the, you know, is this a bit narcissistic? Is this a bit sort of personal? But actually, the, you know, the personal will always be the collective. And it's amazing when people speak to me now, you know, a lot of people have said, you know, I'm, it feels like you're reaching into my brain. And I think, you know, it's uh, obviously that's a, you know, <laughs> um, I like to think they're just being very flattering there. But I think, you know, just giving the language, literally having alonement as a word to describe a feeling that there wasn't a language for before, you know, that's probably, you know, beyond the expert um, voices in there, beyond the memoir, that's probably the biggest thing that I can offer because it allows people to quite simply say, I was having some alonement today. And why was a word needed? Um, I mean, I guess the word single is, is that, is the word single tr to riddled with too much history and rubbish? Well, single, so alonement is quality time alone that you can enjoy, whether you're single, in a relationship, yeah. um, whatever, you know, or whatever array of sort of relationship status you're in. Um, and so, you know, the, re the real thing with alonement was I was trying to see the opposite end of the spectrum from loneliness to alonement. And, and some people say that's solitude, but solitude still has to be qualified. You know, I was, you know, do you enjoy solitude or not? You know, was that, um, you know, was it positive solitude? And the, and the roots of the word solitude 
actually come from the word, the roots of the word loneliness. Uh, so alonement seemed pretty necessary for me. And the amount of people that will now say, oh, I had a, you know, I had a great alonement day today, or I had some, you know, alonement is really important in my relationship. Creating that vocabulary is probably the most important thing that I've done. So what you what you what you want more more than anything else is to have your word put in the Oxford Dictionary. With that, oh yeah, yeah. Well, I'm, I'm close, so I've got it trademarked, um, and apparently it needs to be in popular usage for five years. So uh, oh, does it? Oh, okay. Let's see. Let's see. I mean, there's, there's one or two words that have come out this year, like furlough, which I suspect will 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 are going to jump up. I mean, maybe the, well, the furlough, fourth. furlough might get put first in the queue. I think, yeah. <laughs> and I think alonement is a close second. Lovely. Emma, your sound's on for some one reason or other. That's because I fell off the call and I don't know why. I, 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 it's like I just kind of like tripped up and just fell off the call. I don't know what happened. I'm back I knew you were on walkabout, so. Uh... No, I, well, I, I, can't, I literally can't be any closer to the, to the, mo to the, I was about to say modem, but that's, that shows how old I am. It's not a modem, is it? It doesn't buzz the way it used to. The telephone really yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, uh, the, uh, when we're talking about phrases, um, there was another one um, that jumped out at me from Francesca's book because it actually is one that I think Kate and I have both talked about in our books too, um, which is only meism, and um, it's the it's the feeling that you sort of you don't you know oh there's no point in you know cooking that dinner or um, you know making a special fuss or whatever. Um, because it's only it's only you uh, that you know, and and this weird sort of, I think Kate, you you said earlier we we internalize um, the the society and the, and the beliefs around us, you know, and we can have the best friends in the world who are, you know, the most supportive as you know I'm sure all of us would say we have, um, and who are completely. You know, they might be completely supportive of of, of our alonement. Um, however, that we do internalize this societal hierarchy that says, you know, sort of family is at the top, and you know, and and being in a couple comes, you know, on the way to that, and being single is sort of, it, it's just, it's just not. You know, because you don't perhaps because you don't have anyone to look after, therefore it's not really it's not really so important for you to look after yourself in in some weird way. It, it, is is that a fair sort of description of of only meism? Yeah, it's um it's a really strange thing that we do. It's yeah, and it you know it comes down to you know I have this rule for myself. I always say, look, if I do it for someone else, I have to do it for me. And the reason that you know I still have this rule, even though you know I. I, I wrote the book on being alone in a positive way. And, you know, I can probably you know, say that I practice what I preach. The reason I have this rule is I think it's a process of almost building up self-esteem. It's building up this alone esteem. It's showing yourself every day that you do matter as much. And so, you know, small examples of that can be, um, someone said to me the other day, whenever I watch TV by myself, I just watch it on my iPad. I'd never set up the TV, you know, even though the TV takes, it takes what, like 30 seconds more to set up. I just don't think it's worth doing it for myself. Or, you know, when I, uh, you know, when I eat at home, I, you know, I don't set the table for myself. I don't, you know, I wouldn't use like a proper napkin. I just use a bit of kitchen roll, all of that. Um, and I think, yeah, it's, it's depriving ourselves of really basic comforts just because we're alone. And the impact of that, on your sense of self-esteem, your sense of self-worth in your aloneness, over time, that's what it does trickle in to your um, subconscious. And, that, you know, it, it makes you think that you're not worth enough. And then that can, you know, that can be the thing that makes you say that, stay for that extra drink on that terrible date, or that, you know, that, that makes you not leave your relationship because you think, well, the nights in I have by myself, I don't enjoy, so. Uh, and that you know that's why it's so important. I um uh, I know the last person to sign up for tonight's event, um, and I won't give her a name unless she wants to be mentioned, um, is from Chicago. She is, is watching from Chicago, and um, it struck me is 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 your target audience for this a kind of Western 
culture uh, for maybe this probably for both of you really is this a western culture thing or uh, uh, is this a global audience you're you're thinking of well it's interesting actually because i talk about in my book um some of the countries i visit where it's very much kind of prized to be alone um like i mentioned japan where you know they it's it's really catered to to the solo diner or you know they have hotel little pods just for one person and mm. and and i think it is um it is interesting how how different cultures um view view single time and and view aloneness i feel like um yeah, not to say that they're necessarily better at it, but um, yeah, it does feel like, um, you know, there are definitely some countries that that, that cater to, to people doing things alone a bit better. Japan is probably a good example of that. But I would say just following on from from, from what we were saying about the, the only me-ism, that, that the self-care movement has kind of been a good antithesis to that I think and I feel like now um you know certainly for me like I used to feel like oh there's no point cooking like a nice meal if it's just going to be for me but now I really kind of view it as like a self-care kind of routine of of you know why why wouldn't you you know put that that care and attention into into making a dinner for yourself it's actually even better because it's just for you <laughs> and uh, you don't have to share it <laughs> so <laughs> yeah, yeah have the leftovers the next day for lunch and nobody's going to get into the fridge before you and nick them exactly it's I, I always appreciate uh, about yeah. i know and I, I i feel like well i hope that maybe lockdown has kind of made people um a little bit less only meism because obviously a lot of us have, have spent a lot of time alone or or um you know in our own company and and that's kind of been the the default setting so you know we have had to find those little kind of rituals and and routines to make things special um at home and for ourselves in a way that we might have you know before been been going out or or seeing mm. other people so I, yeah i would think you know having if i'd done you know i was living alone before I sort of got into the alonement thing. And if, you know, if I'd had to go through this time when I didn't have any option but to be alone and not value that time alone, then God, I think I would have, I certainly would have been one of those people getting into a turbo relationship with someone they'd been on one date with on Tinder, you know, three minutes before lockdown began. Yeah. <laughs> I know. I, um... Uh, I was uh, uh, something happened to me today that made me think of, of exactly this this that you've just been talking about and and the sort especially the sort of self care, um, which was bear, bear bear with bear with this story because it is going somewhere. Um, I went uh, to a very very nice um, pub slash restaurant slash inn uh, in Cranbourne Chase, which is an area of outstanding natural beauty just outside Salisbury. And um, it's, again, it's one of those places that it looks, I mean, it just looks like it's made for couples. It looks like, you know, it's just a perfect picturesque um, uh, sort of country pub um, hotel, boutique hotel. You know, I'm sure there are lots of lovely honeymooning couples hidden, hidden around in nooks and crannies. And, um, and, it, and it felt like, and I booked it yesterday because I thought, oh, I really want to have a really, I want to go to this beautiful place and see the views. And the thing that you do when you go out into the beautiful English countryside is you, you have the really nice meal at the really nice pub. And uh, so I thought, oh, I'm going to do that. And I have pretty much got past the point now where I'm embarrassed about d dining alone I, I'm actually never embarrassed about dining. I'm gonna be honest uh, I like Kate I have traveled alone so much uh, that I have eaten many meals alone and it and it became really obvious to me through traveling that um, that actually the things that that I found not at all um, an issue when I was abroad because I was on a job because I was travel writing because I was you know researching for a book all these things I was like of course I'm gonna eat on my own because I'm more likely to talk to somebody and make connections uh, and it was it was it took a little while but I, I I decided well I need to start doing that in my in my real life if that's even the right way to describe it but in my life back home in the UK uh, so therefore, not really embarrassed about going and, um, and and sitting, being the only lone diner in this beautiful restaurant. 
I will say, however, I noticed I obviously still have a little issue because I had Francesca's book with me and I still had a couple of chapters left to read and I could not quite bring myself to read it at the table. And, and I just, I thought, isn't that interesting that 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 that's one step further that it's it, you know talk about owning your alonement it felt too on the nose to be dining alone and reading a book called alonement <laughs> <laughs> that's funny because actually i i was thinking um a lot of people have the book as a crutch right like that i feel like it's kind of even more cool to be like i'm just dining alone i haven't got a phone i haven't got a book I'm just going to soak up that ambiance, but I now see what you're saying in that book. <laughs> I love it. Man. I love it. Yeah, and it's like, you know, it is that, it's, I guess it's, you know, it's that big yellow sunny cover and that's, you know, that's what I sort of, you know, when we went into designing it, it was, you know, it needed to be that big celebration statement. But I think that there's a whole, you know, and, you know, speaking um, to anyone who loves dining alone, part of the appeal can be the anonym anonymity and the, I say people watching, I mean, you know, shameless eavesdropping, the ability to do that. <laughs> so I think, yeah, you know, that, that notion that sort of everyone's looking at you, it can, be, it can be troubling because, you know, we do still have these internalized assumptions about being alone. And really actually, you know, interestingly, that reminds me of something in my book, I talk about the research that I cite around being alone. There's something called this spotlight effect um by it's so it was, you know it was uh devised by a social psych psychologist called thomas gilovich and he um basically found that when we're out in a crowd and we're doing something that feels embarrassing many many less people notice us than we think it's it's probably so we did he did actually the study where he sent this person out wearing a a Barry Manilow t-shirt. I think the subject had to wear Barry Manilow t-shirts in big crowds. And they, they expected, I don't know, 20 people to notice them and only 10 people notice them. And so we think that we have this big spotlight on us, but it's actually much less so than we think. Um, and so I think having a big yellow book that says alonement on it would probably be the equivalent of the Barry Manilow t-shirt there. <laughs> I mean, and again, make you feel like you are being watched. Um, so it's, yeah, it's so funny the psychology behind this, isn't it? It is, and and there is actually a really um, there's a really positive ending to this story, which is that when I went to use the bathroom, on the inside of the cubicle uh, was a framed copy of Desiderata, the famous poem by Max Ehrman, which I'm I'm sure you all know. It's the one that starts. Go, go placidly amid the noise and the haste and remember what peace there may be in silence. I mean, if if you never had that read to you at school assembly, I don't know how you <laughs> avoid it because um, I remember it was like, it used to be like pretty much every fourth assembly at our school, we 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 got read it to it. And um, and so I was just, I was just looking at it because I, I never really, I don't often take in much more than the first paragraph. And right near the end, um, he says, um, Beyond a wholesome discipline, be gentle with yourself. You are a child of the universe, no less than the trees and the stars. You have a right to be here. And I thought, wow, that was written in 1927. That sounds like the self-care movement of today. Mm -hmm. um, that idea of, you know, you absolutely have a right to be here and, you know, be kind to yourself. Uh, I, fa I found that really found that really helpful and um timely and beautiful um I also there's also a line in it which sort of it go, takes me in a different direction because I've also been reading Elizabeth Gaskell's Cranford recently and uh, there's also a line in it that says many fears are born out of fatigue and loneliness mm. and I think that issue of fear being connected to loneliness is a really interesting one um and I wonder if I wonder if this is something that you know the the two of you have kind of explored. I I look at literature, and I see again and again heroines who are expected to be afraid of being alone, um, and sometimes they're not like Jane Eyre, but we kind of think, well, she's you know she's too good to be true, really. 
uh, like so many of Charlotte Bronte's heroines. Um, uh, and then in and then as I said, I've been re- rereading Cranford, which is the wonderful Mrs. Gaskell novel, which is set in a town where it's all single women. Some of them are widowed, but many of them are spinsters, and it's the most beautiful counterpoint to all those romantic novels of the 19th century and um and there's this one storyline where um everyone everyone gets themselves really flustered um because they think that there are robbers around and it's just it's really interesting watching a whole chapter that's kind of like a scene of a lot of single women who who live alone I mean to be fair they some of them do have a maid you know whatever but having to deal with fear and I think that's a real it's it's both a real thing in life but it is also something that's massively exaggerated often in the written word um does does fear do fear and loneliness have a strong connection do you think I, so it's interesting that we're speaking about loneliness because it's of course loneliness awareness week um right now and I've just actually um done a special mini series of alonement my podcast on uh on loneliness for loneliness awareness week for the marmalade trust charity and I think that uh, the, the way they go together I think you know loneliness is a really interesting emotion because it does when people talk about sliding into loneliness it feels quite hopeless. It feels you don't really see, you know, much of a way forward. You don't, you feel quite like almost impoverished in your time alone. Um, and, you know, alonement is the opposite because it feels restoring and, um, you know, fulfilling and, 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 you know, fruitful in that way. But loneliness still very much, you know, I get lonely. I'm sure you know, we all understand what it is to be lonely. And I think that in that state of loneliness where your resilience is low, you can only really be scared of being alone because you can't really see much of a way forward through it. You know, you can't really envision hopeful possibilities for yourself as a lone person. And so other people seem like the easier answer. I don't think they are, but I think that they do seem like the easier answer. Um, and, it, you know, I, I, was having a, I was having a conversation with a close friend um, the other day who just um, very sweetly, she just finished the book and she got in touch with me to speak about it. And she said, Alonement feels like I'm the one steering the boat. Uh, and you know, for her alonement was being single because she's just recently become single. And she said, it just, you know, I, I didn't have to think about it in a relationship. I wasn't necessarily happier, but I didn't feel like I was the one steering the boat. And now, you know, it, I, I suppose it feels scary for her, but it also feels liberating. Um, yeah, so it, you know, it, again, it, I, think it's, I think it's hard. I think that loneliness is a separate, issue in a way in something that does need to be taken seriously and dealt with because you know being alone in a positive way can be wonderful but that doesn't mean that loneliness isn't still something that we risk all the time sliding back into yeah I think it's interesting um I love that line in the poem about being kind to yourself and being gentle with yourself because I think that's something that's really important if you're going to cultivate time alone is just just noticing that inner voice I think all of us are quite kind of critical and harsh when we speak to ourselves. And that's something that I really picked up on um, when, you know, when I'd be traveling is, is that, you know, I'd never speak to a friend in the way that we often talk, talk to ourselves. So, yeah, I think it's, um, it's really important to, to remind yourself to, to be gentle and to, and to, you know, celebrate your own successes and, and, you know, do those positive affirmations even though you feel really stupid at the time but it, it is actually really important to to be your own best friend and to just be happy and comfortable and and you know want to want to sit in your own head yeah and you you both write about um about learning I mean, all three of us write about learning more about ourselves by spending time with ourselves and realizing that you know ultimately yeah you do have this lifelong relationship um with yourself which we 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 don't we don't often many of us don't tend to that relationship in the way that we tend to relationships with others um have you have you 
are there things that you you both look back and uh, you can look back over the last year or few years or you know or that you've identified from writing that that you've discovered about yourselves that you didn't know before hmm. so, yeah, sorry it's it, it's it literally it's I mean it's everyone sort of I always say that um every, you know, it, it was funny the first time we were all able to meet up with friends because everyone suddenly had so many self-reflections and I think this time it's, you know, it's impossible to go through something so momentous without having these revelations um but I guess I mean you know personally and this is you know this is I'm, I'm going to be very honest here um you know I thought that writing a book on personal development would mean that I was sort of cooked you know and that this wouldn't that I I, I, I thought that there'd be a sort of sense of feeling finished and, and having found something um reached a destination through this and and actually I realized um throughout throughout lockdown that you know without if I didn't do some of my own practices, the stuff that I recommend in the book, you know, journaling, um, you know, going for a run by myself, because that's a big alonement thing, you know, looking after myself, cooking for myself, you know, defying that urge for only meism, I realized how quickly I could slide back to the place I was before I even conceived the book. So I think that that was, it was quite humbling, um, but also, yeah, also quite edifying. Kate? Yeah, wow, what a big question. God. <laughs> Sorry, yeah, I just landed that one on you. I, learned, I mean, I've had like a very tumultuous and um, life changing few years, you know, pandemic aside, I've also um, become a mother uh, last year. So yeah, I feel like I have, um, I've really had to draw on these like inner reserves of strength that I maybe didn't know that I had and um, yeah I mean having a baby in a pandemic has has tested me in ways that I I you know couldn't have imagined but like actually weirdly a lot of the things that I I have kind of honed from traveling solo have been really really useful to to new motherhood things like being kind to yourself and and also just kind of being trying to be adaptable and flexible and, and patient uh, but yeah still still working on some of those <laughs> <laughs> Ben do we do we do we need to take some questions the audience are remarkably quiet actually so uh, you know I'm not pushing them for questions if they uh, if they're just enjoying this chat actually <laughs> uh, I have to say I, I feel um, sort of the spare spare part in this little conversation which is entirely pleasurable I have to say you're, um, you're it's all very interesting I'm um, Kate what's running through my med mind is um there's a man now, yeah. Is that right? Or uh, there is, there is a man, yeah, a new man and a new. That's baby. generally what happens when you have babies, and you know, I'm, I, I'm. So, although not always, which is great. You know, there's been some amazing, um, amazing stories of of single single parenthood that I've been reading lately, and you know, so much power to to those those men and women going it alone. But yeah, no, there is there is a, a now a kind of family, so it feels quite strange. But more important than ever, really, to talk about spending time alone and, and solo time because, you know, I don't get so much of it anymore. <laughs> and I really have to carve it out. And I and it's so precious to me. And, you know, just, just a couple of days ago, you know, I, I took myself out for lunch with a book and it was just the most, like, nourishing and, and incredible feeling to be able to do that again and I'm like god why didn't I do this every single day when I could you know pre-baby so uh yeah I feel like alonement is is something that you know it's definitely not just for when you're single it's probably even more important when you're you know in family life or in a couple does anybody else feel and you know I might be this is obviously not always the, this is not necessarily the right the right take home from this um uh but i i have always found and again it's sort of something i devoted one chapter of my book to um that there is a kind of borrowed glamour um about being solo uh and maybe it maybe that entirely depends on what's already going on in your brain and what kind of person you are um like francesca i'm a, I'm a massive extrovert uh, as I said, like Kate, I, I, I'm a journalist and I've, I've spent a lot of time travel writing. So, so my, my, my outlook is, is very, very outwards. And I love 
going to places, um, sitting at a bar on my own, um, knowing that I will get the best, I will get the best treatment from the bartender, um, especially in America. American bartenders are really the best. Mm-hmm. Um, but that that feeling of um, if you if you go somewhere alone, um, you know, you you will like it or not, kind of um, get get some sort of attention. You quite often um, get get really looked after in a way that you wouldn't if you were with a couple or a group. And um, and I and I think there's also this kind of for me, there's a sort of like I say, a borrowed glamour. The idea that I am free and unusual and unique and that I'm going out there and doing these things on my own, um, that is something I very much enjoy. And I think that's why I said earlier um, I made a difference between my my real life, whatever that is, um, my UK life, my British life and my travel life. But I, I, I shouldn't really I shouldn't really be separating these things, because if I have a slightly glamorous travel experience it's still part of my real life right (laughs) yeah Yeah, absolutely and I completely agree that there is something kind of glamorous and mysterious about being you know the solo woman at the bar or wherever and and having talked about you you at, at lunch with your book you know whenever I go out for lunch or for a drink with a notebook you know I have so many people come up and they're like oh, are you a writer? Or, oh, you've, and I thought, God, I wish that I just always took a notebook around. That's like the best thing ever for anyone. Like people just are just instantly fascinated by you. Um, but yeah, there's definitely uh, an, an allure and a glamour of, of being alone. And I think that's what, um, that's kind of what we should should focus on and, and channel. And that's definitely something I did when I was getting divorced is that I was like, okay, like maybe the, the divorcee is kind of quite a kind of, um, you know, yeah, sexy sort of prospect rather than feeling like, oh, I've ruined my life and I'm on the scrap heap. <laughs> I, I suspect you're right. I, th- I think the fact that you've, three of you have written books on the subject means there is a, 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 a level of acceptance that's, that's cre- crept in. And the fact that Francesca's podcast is so successful and uh yeah it's um it's become it's it's become acceptable it's become the normal it's become almost um envied maybe do dare, dare i say that i don't know if that's the case but um, definitely definitely desirable not just acceptable desirable and mm. and important mm. yeah and i think it's i think it's interesting i think i believe there are a couple of novels coming out um even in the next couple of weeks I think Emma Gannon's written one called Olive and I think I think there's another one I can't think what the other one is it'll come to me but um you know we're starting to see sort of women's you know women's novels where the protagonist does not have to you know does not have to find a man at the end of it like that the idea that we're you know and and it is crazy. It's sort of crazy that the marriage plot was was just so essential to so much English and you know Western literature um, that it that it, you really have to look hard to find novels that are actually about women who don't who don't find a a partner at at the end totally um, or don't have children and there's not like a reason why they don't have children like I, I actually um I heard Phoebe Waller Bridge talk about um creating Killing Eve and obviously the the central uh, character in that, the detective, is is married and doesn't have children. And she was saying how lots of people said, to her, "Oh, we need to make a storyline for that." You know, like what what's the reason that she hasn't hasn't had children? And as if there needed to be some like big infertility storyline. And she, she was like really pushed hard against it, as in like, no, she she just decided she didn't want to have children. It's not a, a part of the plot. It's just a, a fact. So yeah, I think we are we are starting to see some some more characters who uh, yeah who don't have to be going down that married with kids route. I know that we're coming to near the end of the hour, but can I just ask one more question, Ben? Because yeah, yeah, yeah. We've got both, of the, the, both of these books are full of really wonderful tips. Like uh, Kate has um, tips about uh, traveling alone at the end of each chapter. Uh, Francesca's has has suggestions and practices, things you can you can do all the way through. Um, they're really 
you know that they're, they're really kind of almost interactive books in some way so when you feel inspired by by the the ideas that are in them you can you know use some of their tips and actually use uh, uh, and 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 um, take them away with you i mean i one of one of kate's i know is actually one that i use which is um making sure that you travel with some sort of little miniature comfort and um i think kate you might have a friend who takes earl gray or, or is it you yourself who takes it is. i take lapsang souchong i've literally i've got 10 lapsang souchong tea bags for my, for, for the next five days of my trip i know so good isn't it although slightly weird when you go through customs with these like sachets of um powder mm. <laughs> yeah but uh, so i i i mean francesca what is your favorite you know what, what's your top life hack from your from your book i mean i, I feel like the big thing in your book is like that that underlies underpins so much of it is we have to find ways to put down our phones for a start hmm. god yeah i mean yeah i think that there's that whole gray area around being what well, being alone constitutes and i think that you know it's very easy to be physically alone but not indulge any of the benefits of alone month if you have if you've got your phone there and you're sitting there you know getting fomo on instagram seeing what else someone else is doing that evening. Um, but I think that the main thing I would say, you know, a lot of what we spoke about is the idea of, you know, practicing, practicing this, not just, you know, sort of be enjoying the theory of the movement and sort of, you know, carrying, you know, the, the big, the big, uh, the, the big book in, in public, like it is about actually practicing and reinforcing that sense of self-esteem and enoughness when you're alone. So I think making solitude dates, which is what I refer to in the book. So, you know, uh, scheduling in time alone, planning ahead so you can sort of get excited about it, you know, making solid, you know, thing, you know, activities that you're going to be doing, you know, what, what music will you listen to, what food are you going to cook, what activity are you going to do, having that to look forward to is a real practice that you can do sort of weekly, even monthly, you know, like a date night with yourself in order to underpin that sense that you and your alonement is enough. Yes. Well, I love that. <laughs> and, you know, I, I yeah, I, I hope that I hope that people will not just get, you know, a lot out of this last hour that we've been chatting, but we'll now go and get a lot. Listen, out of uh, yeah, I'm going to thank you. Thank you, Emma, for, uh, for that. I'm going to um, have to bring it to an end, I'm afraid. We've, we've run a couple of minutes over already, but uh, thank you so much for um, the three of you. This is the easy your books. It'd be easier just to show the spines. Um, it's been an absolute pleasure. This will be on our YouTube channel. I've just plumbed a few links down the chat function. No good to anyone who watched on YouTube, so apologise to you lot. Um, so you've got the YouTube link. There's a hundred and something different interviews, including the one with Emma uh, previously. And uh, there's also our mailing list form and, uh, and also the link to get Emma's book. Uh, I know it's all been about um, Francesca and Kate's books. Um, and... From here, we've got um, five events left this month, including Michael Morpurgo, John Nickel, the RAF guy, Leslie Pierce with Katie Fjord, uh, Ronan Hessian, Penenka, um, and Con Eagledon is our next event. And that's a physical event in the bookshop, actually. So uh, good. Thank you so much all for joining us. Thank you to the audience. Um, uh, thank you, Kate. Thank you, Francesca, for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure. Next time, you, next time you're over from Spain, do uh, come and visit train. I will do. I'd love to. Thanks so much. This was really fun. Yeah, whereabouts in Spain is it? Sorry. I'm in Cadiz. Cadiz. Right in the tip in um, Andalusia. I know Cadiz. Yeah. I, went, I visited Cadiz last February. Oh, so you know how amazing it is. Then. There's the most amazing flamenco bar. Um, we just around the corner from our hotel, which we visited three times in in in, in the week we were there. Which is brilliant. Oh, do you remember the name? You have uh, to... It's one of the it's a like a little back street. Um, it's oh, the, very close to the port. It's very close to where the. So, oh, okay, is it like in the sea wall, kind of like. Uh, right? No, it's within the streets, but uh, frankly, now isn't the time to be talking. We maybe. Right. <laughs> flamenco tangent maybe we can email <laughs> i didn't think we were going to go into flamenco actually very random uh, last minute of, of this event so 
Francesca, do you do flamenco? No. I don't do flamenco, no. <laughs> Maybe I'll have to try it. Maybe we'll have to visit Cadiz. <laughs> I have this tendency to start thinking, do, you know, see something and think, right, I'm going to do that. So I honestly been thinking about a flamenco club in Tring. I, was, I went through this phase of how do we make it work? <laughs> Brilliant. Let's do it and let's all come to Flamenco and Tring. Um, yeah, spin off from this event. Well, Emma, Emma's often visiting. So Emma, you'll do a bit of Flamenco, wouldn't you? Oh yeah, definitely. I used to, I, 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 I loved it when there was a big swing fad. I got really into that. I can totally get into Flamenco. Brilliant, brilliant. I'll work out that uh, club and I'll send you an email, Kate, anyway. Yes. So. <laughs> Guys, thank you for your time once more. It's going to be on our YouTube channel in the next couple of days. And um, yeah, it's been a pleasure. So uh, we'll see you next time. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Thanks, Bye.